All right. Welcome back, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> excellent. Excellent. All right. Um, so we have got a whole bunch of questions uh, from my breakout rooms. Um, and folks, uh, this is a second round. We can put more questions on the table. Um, I'm going to list the questions that were asked in uh, my breakout rooms. Now, if the facilitators have kept track of them, this is Evanique's idea, by the way, of facilitators keeping track of questions. I didn't specify it. Um, either facilitators can recount some of the questions there or everybody and, and, or, and, everybody is welcome to put their own questions down. All right, so let's, uh, I'm going to list the questions that were there in uh, my breakout rooms. First one was about how does dreaming change over lifespan? What are so the- Shri, Yes. Shri Khan, just one, 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 I wanted to say, I do have a few more slides left. Okay. Which may go into something. So I don't how, know if we want to do that. How, how, how long are the slides you think? Um, I can finish them in about 20 minutes. 20 minutes, okay. So then let's let's go, uh, folks, hold on to your questions. Use the device of pen and paper to keep track of them. Otherwise you are liable to lose them. Um, just well, like- let, let, me give a, let, let me give a warning because these slides are a lot more depth, but although I've gone into some of the ideas, but the, they're not as many slides, but they go into much deeper ideas. Absolutely, so, so, so hold questions. on to the questions that you have and keep adding more questions. As, as they as they come up. All right, uh, go ahead, Sanjay. Okay, let me uh, find my slides. I seem to have misplaced them. <laughs> okay, so um, I think they should be, uh, everybody should be seeing this right, right? Yep. You see this? Okay. So we'll continue on um, on the original questions. If I uh, uh, actually let me go back to the um, I don't know if I can do this quickly. So the original questions we had were these: um, What is a dream? Who uh, who dreams? When do we dream? And that's kind of where we left off. The last two are how you know, we dream, what are the mechanisms behind it, and why we dream. So we'll go into these last two um, next. Um, and uh, I'm just um, fast forwarding. Okay, so how do dreams occur? Okay. How do we dream or how do dreams occur? And this is, uh, again, we're not looking at, at um, the uh, content of dreams. We're looking at what actually happens inside of a brain of a person's animal's mind um, and brain when, when uh, a dream begins to occur or while a dream is occurring. So first, let's, let's just mention some prerequisites that our mind must not be active on anything important, on an important task. So this, this, what this means is that the amount of information flowing into the brain um, will be minimal or, or almost non-existent. Um, there's minimal damage or disease um, to, to, uh, to the brain, to, to the person's mind and brain. Um, there is activation by something called the ventral tegmental area. And I'm gonna go into this in, a, in a, the next slide, but this is important um, and I'll expand on this, but this is important, this is a prerequisite. So that what that means is the ventral the VTA area cannot be damaged, cannot be um, uh, uh, pharmacologically um, impacted. Um, also, um, not just prerequisites, but we, uh, we don't need, we do not need REM sleep. So dreaming can occur even when there's no REM sleep. And this was, I put this because this was misunderstood uh, for many, many decades. Only in the late 1990s did we really start to understand, or mid-1990s, we really start to understand this um, and gain a lot of uh, you know, proof around that. Um, <clears throat> also, dreams do not occur um, based on activity in the prefrontal cortex. So dreams are not a function of the executive area of our brain. Um, they're a function of other areas of the brain, not the prefrontal cortex. Um, they are affected by uh, limbic activation. Now, this I'm going to start to get into a little more. What that means is, is primarily the three areas in the brain. Um, I mentioned the the, um, the ventral tegmental area, the VTA, but that that's the area where dreams originate. But once it originates there, it goes into these three other areas, which 
um, overall are called the mesocortical or the mesolimbic system. And I have a diagram later that will explain this a little better, uh, which consists of the amygdala nucleus accumbens. These are the two main areas that, that and these are below the four, below the, um, the frontal cortex. They're part of the cortex, but they're below um, the cortex um, and a little bit into the, uh, uh, the temporal lobes. Um, and so this mesocortical, mesolimbic system is very important uh, for dreaming to occur. And, and the next slide, I'm gonna go a little more into this. Um, so this is a cartoon pictorial of, of a typical human brain. In the center, you see this red dot, which uh, is the area of the ventral tegmental area. And this is very important for, for dreaming. Um, this is uh, believed to be, or all, all evidence shows, all the research, multiple types of research using multiple um, uh, modalities, um, you know, um, have found that this area is highly activated and has very specific types of behavior. Uh, just as we start to dream, during the entire dreaming process and while dreaming uh, ceases to occur. Um, and this area is not active when we don't have dreaming occurring. So in both a positive and negative uh, aspect, it, it's very highly correlated to dream only, not to sleeping. Now, parallel to this, also in this very similar area, um, just below this in the, in the pons, the pons is the bulbous region on the brainstem. The brainstem is this long diagonal part down below. Um, and this bulbous part is the pons, and that's just the, the top of that, the upper region, region of that. There are two distinct parts of our brain. And again, the, um, the, uh, um, the brain stem is one of the most primordial parts of our brain. So pretty much every animal, um, every vertebrate animal has this area. And this is, again, one of the reasons why we believe and understand that the dreaming and, and REM sleep and all that occurs in pretty much every vertebrate, um, as I described earlier. So the, the pons in the, in the brainstem has two distinct clusters of cells which work together and it acts as a, as a switch. When one group of cells is on, the other one's always off and vice versa, they switch on and off. And depending on the state which one's on and off, they always flip flop back and forth and it, it forms a, a switch, literally a switch in our brain, which causes us to have REM, uh, REM activity or non-REM activity. And since the beginning, it was believed that this REM activity, because it's so close to the ventral area, there was a lot of confusion. And, and a lot of the initial researchers assumed or, or believed that they're basically the same process. So they assumed that REM sleep is what causes dreaming. Now we know it's not, that you can have REM sleep, which is separate from dreaming, and you can have dream with or without REM. Um, and, and so earlier when I said that these are two different layers in our brain, when our brain is sleeping, you can have the um, REM, you know, two clusters that I described, those two clusters activated to cause REM activation, um, or REM can be inactivated, it can be stopped, right, when you're sleeping. Um, and whether REM is active or not active, you can have the VTA, this central uh, red region, active, which would cause dreaming. And the same thing can happen when you're not sleeping. So you can have the VTA active when you're not sleeping. That would be a case where you're dreaming when you're having a daydream. Um, or hallucination or other types. So, so this, this area, and it's not, it's not as small as it's shown, but, but this area basically is the source of dreaming in animals that we can tell. Um, and there's a corresponding area in pretty much every mat in the million brain that we found um, very close to this area. Um, so what happens here is that this, uh, you know, many, many uh, millions of, of neurons in this area start to fire rapidly and simultaneously, and they, they give off a very specific type of burst signaling, which um, is highly active. Um, and what happens is these signals transmit down this, this black region, this path. And this path is a well-established path in every person. Um, and so when the TGA is, uh, the VTA is active, um, this uh, uh, um, path, which is, which is the, the uh, mesocortical um, circuit, or the uh, another name for it is the mesolimbic um, dopaminergic uh, pathway or dopaminergic circuit. Um, this circuit basically uh, lights up like a Christmas tree. It lights up very active because the VTA is active and it's driving signals all along this path. And as this the signals travel along this path, it hits the amygdala. This is a very important area. It hits the nucleus accumbens, and then it starts to go into the, the frontal cortex, 
but it seems to go into prefrontal cortex, but it's more important in the frontal cortex. It, it goes into the, cor the frontal lobe in general, but we know that when the prefrontal cortex itself, which is the frontmost part of it, when that's turned off, it doesn't really matter. That doesn't affect dreaming in any way. So this signal mo mostly affects the other parts of the frontal cortex. So these three areas, the amygdala, the nucle nucleus accumbens, and the, um, the uh, posterior parts of the frontal cortex are the three main areas that are active, that are, sorry, that are activated during dreaming. That doesn't mean those are the only regions that are active. Basically, many, many regions of the brain are active. So for example, when you're dreaming and you have a visual aspect to dream, you know, most sighted people have visual aspects, many areas of your parietal lobe and your um, occipital lobe will also be lit up. They will be strongly activated, especially when you have strong visual imagery. And the types of visual imagery you have will determine which areas of your occipital lobe are lit. So for example, somebody talked about not having color when you're dreaming. That's entirely possible. What would happen then is that within our visual system, there are certain areas which deal primarily with color processing. And those systems will be subdued in that person for whatever reason it may be. It may be due to medications, it may be due to damage, it may be due to how their brain developed in youth, whatever the reason is, or it may be a, a temporary aspect to, um, uh, to whatever they're, they're uh, dreaming about. It may be that something subconscious in their mind is causing the dream to be in, in black and white or, or only to have certain hues of colors and not the full gamut of colors. So whatever it is, you know, multiple, uh, almost the entire brain can be active during dreaming but it doesn't have to be active. It depends on the specific nature of the dreams that, that you're having. Um, but the amygdala, nuclear accumbens, and the posterior part of the frontal cortex, these are active during dreaming. And I'm going to explain why, because the, the amygdala is, is central to emotions. It's one of the um, sub-organs, sub-regions of the brain, which is highly correlated with emotional activity. Um, it drives our emotions. And it also gets activated when emotions, excuse me, happen in us. So either way you look at it, either when you have a dream that's emotional or when you have emotions in you that cause dreaming to occur, in either case, the amygdala is activated and it further drives aspects of the dream to occur based on whatever you know, um, happens within your specific amygdala. And, and what happens within your specific amygdala would be an aspect of your subconscious, highly emotional, possibly traumatic um, experiences. So, all, so this is the reason why um, your past subconscious is so important in dreaming because the amygdala um, uh, records and codes a lot of that information. The nuclear accumbens is, is a part of our brain which encodes a lot of our visceral um, aspects. So, um, and, and visceral in, in the sense of, you know, uh, for example, when you're, when you're dreaming that you're running or you're dreaming that you're doing something physical, your nuclear accumbens and, and parts of it uh, and there are other associated regions around it, they would be active. So this, this region seems to be, you know, in terms of how we understand the brain, this, this, is, this makes very much sense um, that it would provide the um, stimulatory uh, um, experiences that we have that makes a dream feel real, you know, feel lifelike, you know, as if our body is really alive and, and, and things are really happening to our body. And that's because of the nucleus accumbens. Um, and the, the, the uh, uh, lateral and the, the um, posterior region of the frontal cortex, that's the part that is active when we are trying to associate things together. We're trying to put things together. And the, uh, the extreme, the, the, the lateral part of it also ties into our motor system. So even though our motor system is subdued and, and suppressed during dreaming, our mind doesn't know that, or our brain doesn't know that, and our brain acts as if it's active. So it will try to activate parts of our of our motor system. It will, you know, this is the reason why when some people, when they have either a disease or for various reasons, they may actually move. In the image that we saw, the video that we saw of the dog moving during dreaming, is because um, the motor the uh, motor uh, um, areas of the brain are really activated just as if as it's activated when we're awake but because the body has been paralyzed um, hopefully fully um, then we won't see any external movement but if, if it's only partly or or not uh, fully not correctly paralyzed then you will see uh, movement and this is also the reason why we have um, sleepwalking because sleepwalking happens when people um, because the brain is active in sleepwalking um, and but the activity during sleepwalking is 
we, we don't believe dreaming is happening in strictly black, although it can be. But um, their uh, um, other parts of their uh, posterior frontal cortex is active. Again, the prefrontal cortex is not active because that's turned off in sleep. This is the reason why when people are sleepwalking, they're not able to make very sophisticated decisions. They might make some simple decisions, but they're not able to make planned or very um, uh, complex um, activities. Uh, most of the behavior that they exhibit during sleepwalking is automatic and not, you know, because they're low, lower level processes that are, that are causing that, um, not high level processes. That's part of the PFC. Um, so these, this, this is schematically what happens in, in, uh, to, to cause dreams. Now I'm going to go a little further to explain why we're so sure of this. Um, so there's been a lot of research and um, one of the things that was found early on in the 1930s, last, uh, almost a century ago, was that um, there's a region, there's a, there's a dense cluster of, of, axon, of, um, of uh, nerve fibers, axons, which um, carry signals from the BTA through this area, through the uh, uh, mesolimbic dopaminergic pathway, that's this green pathway, and they pass through this area. And what, was, what, what we found is that recently, in recent studies, people found that if there's any kind of damage in this area, and the damage has to be both to both hemispheres, left and right hemisphere. You have to remember that we have two hemispheres. So when we're talking about this, both of the hemispheres have to have damage in this area. And very few people have damage in both areas. So it's very difficult to study this. But the way that it was studied was that in a century ago, there was an operation called a, a, a neuroleukotomy, which better known as lobotomy. Lobotomy was actually a, a popular um, surgical intervention performed on many people who had either schizophrenia or sometimes they had um, epileptic seizures. They had certain various types of disorders for which a lobotomy was performed. The lobotomy basically severed this exact area of the brain. It basically cut through. They actually inserted a, it wasn't a knife, but it was, it was a very sharp wire, which literally severed this region, right? And they didn't know what would happen, but what after lobotomies were performed, these lobotomies were performed in thousands of people. So the literature records thousands of these uh, situations where pretty much every person who had a lobotomy, lobotomy performed lost completely their ability to dream. They never dreamed after that, okay? And in people who had a partial lobotomy, they had some function of dream, people who, who in which the operation was performed, but this region was not correctly severed, a different region was severed, they retained the ability to dream. And because of that, the, the doctors, uh, neurosurgeons basically realized that probably we didn't get that area correctly. They went back and, and severed it and they found that, yes, that was true. When they severed it, yes, their um, uh, uh, illness that was trying to be treated was corrected or it was controlled at least, but they also lost dreaming. So this is another indication that this, this is a very strong correlate to dreaming, not sleep, not REM, but dreaming itself. Um, and, and so in all of those patients, um, when this signal was severed, the signal never went beyond this. It did go into the amygdala. So people who who you know have this performed, they may still have emotional um, activation when they're asleep, but they would not recognize as dreaming because dreaming is basically when you the recognition recognition of our dream happens in the frontal cortex. A lot of our conscious mind um, exists in our frontal cortex. So because that awareness has been severed. These people, they, their amygdala would be activated. So in a sense, they would have a type of dreaming occurring where their, their emotions are being stirred up just as it, it gets stirred up in, in our, you know, a normal person's dream, but they would not be aware of it. They would be completely remain subconscious. Um, so this, this, you know, these things also give us insight into um, the, phys the physiology and the pathophysiology of, 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 of dreaming. Um, Next, let me go into a little more detail of, of uh, why. So this is the last question we, we had. Why do we dream? Why do dreams occur? And, and this field really is, you know, the name is uh, honorology. That's for the formal study of why dreams occur. Why, and this is, again, not the analysis of dreams. This is the phenomenological aspect, the um, biological aspect of dreaming. Why does it occur? How does it occur? but more specifically, why does it occur? So, so far we, we've looked at dreaming occurring spontaneously when conditions allow. But the other side, the flip side of this is that it can also be, um, it can also be created um, intentionally using medication, using 
um, uh, disease states or, or surgical uh, interventions. Or if the person has trained their mind, um, they can do it through uh, certain types of altered states of consciousness. So basically, they all share this common theme that there's a quietness within the brain that creates the environment for dreaming. So this quietness needs to be there. So when the quietness occurs, dreaming can occur. Also, there's a paralysis of the body, which turns off um, the sensory input, the receptors of our, of our body, of our brain. Um, and that also is something that helps. Um, so these two things have to happen. Um, so when these two things are, are, are occurring, much more likely that, that you'll start to enter into dreamlike state. The third thing that we talked about is a lack of internal signal, sensory deprivation. That's another quick way, a very reliable way of, of forcing dreams to happen. So, and, and then we last talked about the mesocortical, mesolimbic uh, system, which, which allows dreaming to occur. Um, so the, um, the mesolimbic um, dopaminergic uh, circuit that we talked about, this is also known as a motivational drive. It's also known as a seeking system. And this system occurs in us all the time when we're awake or when we're asleep. But the difference is that when we're awake, it gives us purpose. It gives us something to do. So when we're awake, our mind is always aware of our surroundings and our mind always has motivation or a notion of what we should be doing. So right now, you're, you're either thinking about something because your mind wants to think about that, or you're listening attentively because your mind wants to, or you may want to go into a daydream, in which case you'll actually go into a daydream and you'll stop you know, um, absorbing all these other stimuli around you. Um, so there's motivation in every one of our brains, irrespective of what state we're in. Um, and the, uh, the mesolimbic, uh, mesocortical system is what causes that. It, it gives us a drive, it gives us um, goal-seeking behavior. But the same system exists when we're sleeping. And what that system does when we're sleeping is it creates this. Um, so this is one of the theories of the next slide. I'm going to go a little more into the theory side of it because this is where we start to get into. Um, so just a, a quick uh, um, point. This question we don't have a definitive answer to, obviously, because it is such a complicated thing. And the tools that we have today to delve into our brain while we've been able to do phenomenal types of, of um, measurements within living brains. Um, there's still a lot that we can't access. For example, the, the uh, um, quantitative nature of the various types of, of neurotransmitters and neuropeptides that occur within a brain. Also, there are aspects of sleep, which is important, which we don't have um, um, enough information about. And these things you know, give us doubt um, and, and questions around exactly uh, you know, this, this question around sleep, but there's enough that we know that, that we, we have a few uh, postulates, two main postulates, and I'm going to go to the next slide. But basically, this, this motivational system, the seeking system, is a part of our dreaming. And one of the theories is very heavily driven into that, um, that that part of our uh, brain, of our um, behavior, uh, is what drives us to form interpretation of whatever um, signals happen to be in our, in our brain. Um, and so that side of the theory um, takes on this notion that dreams are not passive, they're active. That our brain actively creates or actively interprets dreams. Um, again, that's one theory. Um, the other part of the uh, uh, mesocortical mesolimbic system is that it tells us that dreaming is purely a biochemical uh, um, activity and it's initiated by neurons only, um, and specifically the ventral tegmental area. The neurons in that area are the most important, although not the only. You know, the other parts of the brain that, we descri that I described also are, are important. But the VTA region is, is instrumental in starting, initiating um, dreams in all mammals um, that we've seen. Therefore, um, it is a biochemical process, dreaming. Um, it is not, um, you know, as, as we used to speculate earlier, that, that may be uh, more philosophical or more, um, you know, uh, spiritual aspects of dreaming that uh, has, at least from the scientific community, that, that's been dispelled. Um, Sleep-induced, uh, so now I'm going to get into a little, little bit more of the areas which 
we understand somewhat, but we don't understand fully. And then the last slide I'm going to have where I go into the two main theories. I'm not going to go too much into it because I, I think you know we, we the people have questions and answers. So um, as far as again, when when dreaming occurs, typically when dreaming occurs, it occurs when we're sleeping. Um, and so a lot of this research overlaps with the sleep research because it's difficult to separate the two because dreaming usually occurs in humans when, when we're sleeping. It's very difficult to have subjects in which they don't have sleep yet they dream. Um, there are people like that, but they, they typically have a lot of disorders. Um, they have insomnia and, and therefore their, their mind has a lot of other problems. So, so anyway, so what we've seen, what we know is that um, when we're dreaming, um, dreaming helps us to, uh, to uh, so, so when we're dreaming, multiple, almost the entire brain is active, can be active, not, doesn't have to, but it can be active. And what that means is that all of the neuronal connections in our brain, um, or a large part of them, can be activated during dream states or hallucination states. Um, and if they're activated, every time you activate uh, synaptic connections, what that does is it either strengthens synaptic connections or the ones that are not activated, they get paired away, they, they die. So one of the things that we know, that we've learned is that dreaming helps to either recapture or to pare down, to either strengthen or to eliminate synaptic connections. So, and another way to look at this is that um, somebody who has uh, trauma, right? If their trauma, which is encoded in their amygdala, their amygdala is always activated and their activation is always around specific types of imagery. Let's say that, that their, their um, imagery doesn't have to necessarily replay the trauma, but it reminds them of certain things associated with the traumatic area maybe, or the people around them, or the, or the geographic location, or even a building they were in, or whatever, right? Um, so when they're dreaming, those traumatic memories will be activated at a higher level than, than uh, baseline. And what that means is that those memories being reactivated will be re-energized and strengthened. And this is one of the problems with um, why it's so difficult to, uh, to uh, treat trauma, severe trauma, because when you're dreaming or when you're even, even queasing, even when you're awake, this, this is probably happening also when we're awake, that those activated uh, memories uh, recapture and they, they re-enervate those memories and they strengthen those memories. And that's why those traumatic memories remain because it's so difficult to um, uh, change them because just the process of dreaming tends to make them um, strengthen. Um, so memory consolidation, memory recall, memory strengthening, these are all aspects of sleep and dreaming that we know about. Um, and so what that means is that this may be an intentional method, or it may be an artifact. It may be a passive intent. We don't know if it's active or passive. This is what I, on the next slide, I'm gonna go more into that. But whether these things happen for active intentional reasons, or whether they happen for passive reasons, because these signals happen to be in our brain, and this is the end result of these signals happening to be there. We're not sure which it is. It's possible that our brain has an area or areas of the brain which intentionally cause all of this to happen, which would make it an active process or there may be no such part of the brain that does that. It just may be that although our brain is, is kind of emitting signals because these signals are, are trapped in our subconscious and because we, we uh, experienced them you know, the last day. And so they're still fresh in our mind and because they're echoing around our brain, that echoing is a passive process and, and that causes this to happen. So which one it is, we're not sure, but in both cases, the similar things will happen. Also, it's important to understand that, that when we're dreaming, most of the brain is still active. 80, about 85% of the brain is still active. As, as far in terms of the percentage of energy used, 85% of the energy of the brain is still active during sleep and dreaming. Therefore, it really doesn't give our brain much rest. It does give our body rest because our body's been, been um, paralyzed mostly, um, but our brain doesn't get much rest. Um, but what does happen is during sleep, um, there are many processes that happen in, in the brain. The brain actually changes many states. You know, I've I talk mostly about neurons in this, but this is one of the times when I'm going to me mention other uh, cells in our brain, other than neurons. Um, astrocytes are many types of glial cells. And basically what we know, very strong uh, studies that have shown, multiple studies that have shown this, is that during sleep, therefore also during dreaming, um, our our, the, all of the different types of cells in our brain literally shrink. 
What that means is the interstitial space within our brain, the space between the cells, not only between neurons, but between glial cells also, between all the cells. There's more space between these cells. And what that does is that causes a greater flow a cerebral final, spinal fluid. This is a fluid that, that our, our brain is soaking in and, and, and kind of floating in. Our brain is floating in, in liquid. It's not floating in, in, in blood. It's floating in this uh, semi-clear liquid. Um, and that liquid um, has an easier time flowing within our brain when we're asleep and, and therefore when most of the time when we're dreaming. And what that does is that causes clearance of amyloid plaques. There, there are many types of plaques that build up. I, I talked about this in a prior talk about uh, dementia and Alzheimer's. And there are some questions around that, that can, can dreaming, sorry, can sleeping help, uh, um, um, uh, let's say Alzheimer's, so certain dementias. And in theory it can, but it doesn't do a whole lot. Um, so the theory side of it is that because the cerebral spinal fluid can flow more readily and it's, it's more easier and in more volume flows during sleep, these amyloid plaques can be removed more quickly and more easily when we're sleeping. So in theory, it can have a beneficial effect for dementia, but the volume of plaque that's actually removed is not that high enough to, to, to help with dementia. So anyway, that's a side. Um, the last point here is the metabolic effect in, in brain homeostasis. So these, I'm not going to go into, but these again are speculative. We're not really sure of it, but uh, again, metabolic effects about exactly the amount of um, activity in neurons during uh, so for example, all of our brain is not active during dreaming. Parts of it are. Um, and depending on the type of dream, it may be a large percentage or a smaller percentage. But there may be effects to that in terms that, um, similar to how in, in, during sleep, the brain cells shrink. There may be other effects in that um, for, uh, um, sorry, my, um, so um, epigenetic, for epigenetic reasons, um, it may be that the physical structure of neuronal connections may change during dreaming um, due to the metabolic difference in dreaming. Um, so that's something that hasn't been explored well. Brain human homeostasis is another area. This, this is much more complicated. I'm not going to go into this at all, but the, the fluidic aspect I just described, that's one. The energy of it, that's another. The, the types of neurotransmitters, the prevalence of neurotransmitters, the extent of signal neurotransmitters, all of these things are things that the brain tries to regulate itself. Um, in, in one of the breakout rooms, I, I went into this a little bit, but basically the brain tries to keep itself, just as our body keeps itself in regulation, the brain also does that. So there, there are probably are aspects of that homeostasis that, fall, that affects dreaming, um, but I'm not gonna go into that. Um, the last slide I wanna go into is specific people and the two main theories around it. So from the, in 1953, from my knowledge, is when, when dream research really began. The first two theorists here, Kleitman and Zernsky, they, they really figured out that there's this thing called REM sleep. Um, Michael Michel Jouvet, he was a, another researcher who uh, did a lot of work in REM sleep. He, he actually uh, did phenomenal work. And up to about the 1960s, early 1970s, a lot of the research was predominantly what, what we knew, knew about dreams. And at, up to that time, dreams and REM sleep were synonymous. Basically, uh, everyone believed that they, you couldn't have one without the other, and dreaming was an outcome of REM sleep. Then um, a few years later, um, Alan Hobson, um, he's a, he was a graduate student of my, uh, Michel Jouvet. He came up with, he did a lot of research, and he came up with a, a theory in which he felt that dreams are a passive process. And his initial theory basically said that the dreams were, were linked to REM sleep because his, his uh, thesis advisor, his, his uh, um, um, uh, mentor, um, that's the theory he came up with. And that's the theory that, that Hobson learned. And so he completely uh, uh, you know, accepted that theory. Though in the 90s, as we started to get more research, he revised this theory. But the, re the theory was that um, dreams are linked to REM sleep um, in the 90, 90s. He, he uh, went away from that. Then he, his theory also um, had this component, which was that um, there are random uh, uh, signals that arise in the brain, in any animal's brain. Um, and he, he completely used, uh, understood and, and, and uh, intended to use the word random. So what I described earlier, as far as um, echoes of the past, he wasn't talking about simply echoes of the past. He was talking about completely random signals arising. 
um, not geared toward um, past experiences. So he discounted the notion, or actually at that time, people didn't understand, uh, this was in the early 70s, people didn't understand that we had these latent um, uh, strong signals that existed in the brain because neuroscience was in its infancy then. So his idea was that we had these random signals, literally random, anywhere and everywhere in the brain that can occur. And because these truly random signals are, uh, arose, that's the reason why our dreams seem so weird and strange because you know this 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 uh, image of a car popped up and this um, sound of a, of a rabbit uh, or a horse popped up and your dream was about a horse that or a car that sounded like a horse or you know something bizarre and that's his explanation because you had these random signals arising that's why our dreams seem to be random and and, and you know chaotic and sporadic. Um, he changed it after, in 1999, he revised that theory after we started to see that emotion and the amygdala was strongly tied into to dreams. And then ultimately, he, um, he revised his theory further um, in, uh, in that biochemical activation was partly at play, specifically acetylcholine, which is a very uh, powerful neurotransmitter that's uh, implicated in dreaming. Um, uh, so his theory is based around this. Now, all of the uh, ideas that he had still um, had the notion that dreaming was a passive process, meaning there was nothing in our brain that caused us to start to dream. Basically, his idea was that dreaming basically was a result of things happening in our brain. And the reason why things happened were because of biochemical activation, either through medication or through disease um, or through emotions. But there was activation that happened in our brain. And these activations resulted in this thing that our, our forebrain interpreted to be a, um, a dream. It, did, it didn't interpret actively, it, it interpreted in a passive way. And, and let me give one example on this. So if you think about how rainbow forms, right? Um, if we didn't really understand rainbows, it would be plausible to say that, well, rainbows form because there are these blue molecules in the sky and red molecules and green molecules and all these molecules kind of coalesce together into the shape that forms a rainbow. So the red molecules form this band of redness and the blue molecules form a band of blueness and the green molecules, et cetera. And so you have these clustering bands of molecules and they all form together and they all link together to form this rainbow. Well, that would be an active description that you have to have physically mo molecules that are colored and these molecules would have to link together and these molecules have to form a structure which is uh, form us to, to uh, the shape of a rainbow. That would be an active process of how a rainbow forms. But today we know rainbows don't form that way. What rainbows are, or it's a, uh, uh, um, it's a um, uh, reflection, um, a, a, um, a refraction of photons of light um, that happen to flow through individual water droplets in, in the atmosphere, you know, around clouds. And when light is refracted through these, you know, hundreds of thousands and mil or even millions of, of water molecules there's a passive process whereby the photons, because they're refracted in different angles, um, it causes the photons to split up into individual uh, colors. Um, and therefore what our eye sees is that the uh, photons are channeled into different distinct uh, regions, which we interpret, our, our eye uh, and our brain interprets into a rainbow pattern, but it's a passive process. There's nothing physical happening to the photons. There's nothing physical happening to anything else. The photons are the same as any other, except they're being sorted by the angle of refraction through the water molecule. So that's a process process. So that's what Hobson was describing. He was describing a completely passive thing that happens in our brain when we dream. The other side of it is someone called Mark Soames. Now, Hobson died last year. Um, Mark Soames is still alive. So this dispute between them, there was a long standing dispute between the two. That dispute has died out because Hobson's no longer alive. But there are other researchers who still stand by Hobson's theory and the other researchers who, and through theorists who still stand by Soames' theory. So these are two dominant theories that still exist. So Soames' theory is that this is all active. And he's the one who, who um, uh, one of the, the main people who came up with this uh, dopaminergic circuit that I described earlier. He, he did a lot of research in, in, around this and, and, and proved it in multiple ways. Um, he uh, believes that uh, dreams strongly he believes that dreams are separate from, completely separate from the REM mechanism. That, that, dream, that dreams can be in a person's mind and the REM uh, system can be in a person's mind. They both are overlaid and you can have one on the other off, you can have one on the other off, you can have both of them on, you can have both of them off. They're completely independent of each other. 
Um, and, and these four states can happen either in a wakeful person or in a person who's asleep. It's independent of whether you're waking or sleeping. So there's eight formations and uh, dreaming and REM are completely separate in all of those eight. That's his idea. Um, he also um, uh, believes in the emotion uh, laden aspect of dreaming, but he believes that it's much more active and the emotions are much stronger. He actually takes a Jungian, even a Freudian uh, um, uh, interpretation of this. And he believes that, that there is more meaning in dreams because of how he looks at it, that, that there's intentional processes I mean, therefore, you know, our, our brain is trying to tell us something. He, he, although he doesn't, he would, he's, I've never heard him say that exactly, that our brain is trying to tell us something. He, I don't think he would go that far. I think the way he sees it is that our brain, I think he sees it kind of in the middle that our brain causes things to happen whereby um, the only interpretation that we can have is heavily influenced or flavored by the past experiences and these emotions that we have. And the reality today is that many researchers believe that we're somewhere in the middle of what these two theorists have proposed, that aspects of, uh, I believe that the, the mesocortical uh, circuit is a very active part of it. I believe emotions are a very strong part of it, but I believe that it is purely biochemically activated. And not that it's random, but it, it is in, uh, uh, elicited by emotions, um, especially uh, from the amygdala. So um, this is, uh, let me stop here and then we can uh, have some more Q&A. Wonderful. So let's do one more quick round of Q&A. Uh, folks, we are running a little late. So go ahead and uh, try to keep your questions as brief as possible. Even if you have asked the same questions in the breakout rooms, you're welcome to repeat them right now. Um, let's do them live. Uh, so uh, folks in my breakout room, if you, even when you ask the question in the breakout rooms, go ahead and ask it now uh, live so we can get as many, you know, questions on the table. And we're going to, Sanjay will have to keep the answer short so we don't go too long. So let's go with questions. So we're going to go with uh, Joe, followed by Ayala, followed by Vanessa. Folks, keep your questions short, okay? Uh, Joe, go ahead. Um, yeah, just uh, two really brief questions here. Um, is one is a, about the idea of hypnagogia and what parts of the brain are actually uh, affected uh, when you're in a state of hypnagogia. Um, and the second one would be, if you you know want to go into it, it's just this distinction between hypnosis and dreaming, uh, and what parts of the brain and what are the differences between those two? Uh, because there are some similarities in those. Very good. Thank you. Next up is Ayala followed by Vanessa and Goran. Ayala. Oh, just a second. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I have to unmute everybody. Hold on. Go ahead, Ayala. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, yeah, no question. And, and that is why do we dream in a symbolic way? Um, I realize that the symbolism is inferred by us. Maybe we project this meaning, but uh, I think there is more and more evidence that the brain, we can use the term tells us something, but is is depicting to us an issue that bothers us or is unfinished, but in a symbolic way, which means through a metaphor, through a hyperbole. Why is that? Wonderful. Thank you. Next up is uh, Vanessa. Vanessa, go ahead. Okay, I'm going to re-ask that one question about why someone believe after 75 years, it was the first dream they ever had and then the second one, not so much dreaming in black and white, but why you may only be like um, focused or heightened on maybe the behavior of the people in it, but it's almost like you're unaware if there was color, it was muted, it's like was, wasn't important to the dream. So you couldn't recall that, but you could tell who was in it and exactly you know how the dream played out, but everything else was like secondary, if there's a point to that or a reason. Wonderful, thank you. 
Uh, next up is going to be Goran, followed by Dave and Cheng. Goran. Uh, lucid dreaming. Is that like a full-blown dream? And what about prefrontal cortex uh, being active in lucid dreaming? Uh, and there was some research about communication with researchers and they can do math, you know, in, in, during the lucid dream and communicate the result back to the researchers. What's, what about this prefrontal cortex not being active in a regular dream, being active in a lucid dream or what or not? Wonderful, excellent. Thank you, thank you, Goran. Next up is Dave followed by Cheng. Dave. Dave, what has happened to your sound? Okay, looks like Dave has a sound problem. All right, next up is going to be Cheng followed by Joe. Cheng. Yeah, uh, my question is uh, actually, I mentioned the dream, it's not black and white. It's just like you don't aware of the color. You don't, it's so abstract. It's like you did, it's more like a concept or something. So like somebody mentioned earlier, it's not black and white, just you didn't even notice the color. It's more like you didn't even notice form. It's more like the feeling somehow. It's like that's what I mentioned about dream. Maybe it's like you mentioned, some part of the brain is focused more on the feeling or meaning instead of the form and the color. Thank you. That part is not, yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you, Cheng. Uh, what is it that, we notice. Uh, next up is going to be Joe followed by Mike. Joe. Uh, just building off Goran's question, I thought it was really good, is this idea of uh, lucid dream and what are the pros and cons in that? But more importantly, if you have an answer, and I, and I understand if you don't, uh, why do immersive video games actually uh, result in uh, higher rates of lucid dreaming. There is, there's a causation that's been established, but I was just wondering if, if you were familiar with that. Thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Mike. Mike, question please. Question please. You, you um, included Mark Solms in your, bio, in your bibliography. Um, he's uh, been a researcher in the area of consciousness and of all things, Penrose's uh, quantum effects. Did you run into anything in uh, your research that implies there's a continuum between all these phases that leads up from consciousness to lucid dreaming and, and how they're all tied together? Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, next up is going to be Madeline followed by Marco. Madeline. Um, I just have a question. All those different uh, stages of sleep uh, that take about an hour and a half going one way and then an hour and a half going the other way at a maximum, uh, would that be considered one complete cycle that would include the interstitial opening of the allowing the uh, cerebrospinal fluid to flow through? Or do you need more time in addition to that to have a complete sleep one complete cycle. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madeline. Next up is Marco. Marco, go ahead. Um, two quick questions. Um, like, what are the conditions to have, um, um, to remember dreams? And also, um, like, to have more frequent dreams? Um, and also, um, it. what about like recurring dreams? um like ha having a dream um even like or occurring one like during the day that you've had at night <laughs> wonderful thank you uh thank you marco i'm going to add a couple of questions from my um breakout rooms one was on what do your dreams tell you about yourself what if you are having scary dreams versus good dreams what's what's the pattern of what what are the dreams telling you about yourself uh, next one is that how do dreams change over a lifetime? Uh, how are dreams of a child different from a middle-aged person? What happens in old age to dreams? Uh, those are the two questions I will add from that. Um, okay, so let's start with uh, lucid dreaming. What is lucid dreaming and how is it? What, 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 what do you think of it? Okay, so... Um... 
this is this is an interesting area. So lucid dreaming basically is is uh, it's a normal uh, it's the dreaming. So it, it's it's where a person is able to dream, but they're able to control aspects of what happens in their dream. Um, so the dreaming side of it, the dreaming part of it, is normal to any other dream. The dreaming um, uh, segment of their mind is behaving the same as any other person who who is dreaming. However, um, for various reasons, they've either learned or they have the ability to direct what happens in the dream, um, to some extent even control what happens in the dream. Um, so, what what what? And 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 um, Goran, when he asked this question, I, I specifically made a note because he he talked about and, and there's a lot of research that that I'm familiar with, which um, talks about um, using lucid dreaming as a vehicle for further research into dreaming in general, because people who can do lucid dreaming, um, they allow us to have a way of communicating bidirectionally, meaning the person who's dreaming, the person who's under study, they can communicate to the researcher and the researcher can communicate back to that person. So you can basically ask questions and have answers from the person as they're dreaming, um, but they have some bit of control over um, you know, the types of things they can control. So, um, Lucid dreaming is a real phenomenon. It exists. It's not common, but um, uh, I don't know the percentage-wise how many people. But it's, I, I believe it's, it's, you know, ten percent or less. It's not a, a large number. Um, Joe had a question related to this. What he said that um, people who ha are who play video games, I, I presume large amounts of hours of video games, um, seem to uh, have a heightened ability to. Uh, control their dreams, basically to have lucid dreams. I have not heard of that. I'm not aware of that, but um, I don't discount it. It, it, it could be uh, true. Um, it also could be false. It could, it could also be that, that it appears that way, but actually it's not the same thing as lucid dreaming. We're not, I'm not sure. I can't uh, talk about the video game aspect of it. But um, if somebody is really having lucid dream ability and sensations, um, what, they're, what, what happens is that, um, and it can be, two ways. It can be that their physical body is paralyzed less, so they might actually have control over some of their muscles, especially the facial muscles. Or it could be that their body is still fully paralyzed, but they can simply, within their mind, direct what, whatever they do in their dream. So, um, you know, if they want to, if something is happening and they don't like what happened in the dream, they can backtrack and do something else in the dream. They can act, literally control the dream, although there seems to be limits on what they can do. I mean, you know, this is not something that's been researched so much, so we don't know the extent of control over a dream, but it doesn't seem to be that they can control completely everything. It's not like they can come up with completely elaborate, it's not like they're creating a whole movie out of thin air and they're dreaming that movie. It's not like that. Many aspects of the dream still is automatically happening, probably from their um, internal emotions and, and, uh, and drives, but Thank they're you. able to control them to some extent. Um, Thank you. Uh, next, uh, can I go to the next question? Okay. Our next question is on remembering the dreams. Why is it that we remember some dreams and not others? Why? What is it with remembering and what aspects of the dream we remember and what aspects we don't remember? So if you, if you, if you heard that, that dreaming is just another type of mental activity, it's another type of thinking, right? If you understand that and agree with that, then it'll help you understand the answer I'm about to give is that anytime we're thinking about anything, okay, if the thoughts or the ideas or the emotions, and emotions are the same as thought, you know, there's no distinction between emotions and thought. The emotions and thoughts that you experience, whether you're awake or whether you're dreaming, they can have emotional impact on you. And if they have emotional impact, you remember them. So if you happen to be dreaming, and the dreams are about something important to you emotionally, or they connect to past things in your emotions, then they'll be more memorable and you remember them. Okay. Uh, next, I'm gonna take two of the questions. What, what do your dreams tell you about yourself? Or another uh, question that was asked is, why do we dream in a symbolic way? Yeah. I I like this question a lot because it's 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 something we've all you know for throughout you know the history of humanity we've wondered about this. What do they mean? 
you know, what is it? Does it mean something about us or or something greater? Um, so I and and I can only give my personal belief on this or, or understanding of this. I I think that there are some. Uh, I would say more than some, but I'm trying to think of the right word to 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 describe this. But there there is some level of um, ascertainability to what meaning a dream has um, corresponding to our internal states of our brain, the stored memories and history in, our, in us as a person. Um, there is a correlation, a link to that. Um, the level of strength um, will vary from person to person because this is an aspect of memory. So somebody who has a good memory, their memory system is very strong and they remember things in detail. Their dreaming will also show these same characters. Somebody who has the opposite, their, their dreams will not be as, as, as robust and probably may not uh, show a lot of the, the uh, very deep uh, uh, historical aspect of their lives. Um, as far as the symbolism in it, this is something that, that um, so the symbolic nature of it, I believe, is tied more to what we might call free association, right? So when we're free associating, in a sense, that's what I believe our brain is doing when we're dreaming, that these things pop up in our brain and our, the uh, lateral, the uh, uh, posterior part of our uh, frontal, frontal lobe, frontal cortex, is basically doing something like free association, linking them together in whatever types of ways. Again, depending on the strength of some of these signals, strength of some of these memories and information that we're remembering. And so if, if one night you have a dream and one memory is really, really strong, and on a different night you have, a, you have, you have the same memory come, but that memory is much less in strength, it'll change the aspect of a dream. And so you may have a different interpretation of your dream those both different nights. Now, does that mean that something different is happening? Well, that memory, the strength of that memory is different on the two nights. So in that sense, yes, something's different is happening. But are you a different person from night one to the second night? No, you really aren't. So that's why I tend to think that it is not really giving us a lot of strong um, intrinsic information about us as a person, but it's giving us flavors of, of things that are still important to us, that still matter, and that are still emotionally relevant to us. Thank you. Um, next question is on um, hypnosis, dreaming, and hallucination. What is the connection between relationships between dreams, hypnosis, and hallucinations? So hypnosis is another area that's been researched, and, and I won't um, say I'm an expert. I'm not an expert in dreaming either, but I, I won't. I, I, I have less... Uh, um, formal understanding of, of hypnosis, although I've, I've watched and researched to some extent. Um, hypnosis is not dreaming in any way. Um, hypnosis is, is um, or, or the aspect that hypnosis affects in us is our um, coercibility of how easily we can be driven uh, to um, overcome our will or the strength of our willpower, you might say. That's the aspect of, of hypnosis that I've learned and understand. And that has, so that has nothing to do with dreaming. Um, and uh, the correlation, not quite the, the, the um, relation between these, um, actually, I, I think Joe also asked, he asked about hypnagogia. Um, so I think this is related to this. So the, so hypnosis is, one way to think of it is that there's something called self-hypnosis where you can basically um, convince yourself or tell yourself things, even if you don't believe them. So that aspect of it may be applicable in dreaming or it may be applicable in hypnagogia. Hypnagogia basically is, is it's, a it's a transitionary period from when you're fully awake to when you start to enter dream state. So that transition is called hypnagogia. So that's the time when you would be able to fool yourself to convince yourself. So for example, people ask questions about, how do you get yourself to dream about something that's important to you? Or how do you get to do something in a dream? Well, this may be, again, it's not proven, it's not, it's not possible for every person to do this because dreaming and, and all of these um, cognitive processes are complicated. It varies from person to person. But if you are able to control your thinking in a wakeful state and you're able to convince yourself things, almost hypnotize yourself of things, then it might be possible for you to use these techniques to 
get your brain to go in a certain direction of dreaming. But to me, hypnosis and dreaming are, are completely different. Okay. Uh, last question about what happens to dreaming over, over a lifespan? What, what are dreams of a child like and what are the dreams of somebody who is very old like? So uh, the, the understanding I have of this is that, and again, there's no right or wrong answer to this, um, and there's no definitive answer to this because it depends on the person. But if you think about it, a dream is a metaphor, is a reflection, is an echo of your past history, of you, the person, your direct past history. So a child has very low past history, right? But whatever past history they have, that will be reflected in their dreams. Um, their dreams probably will tend to be around um, cartoons and parental figures and friends and uh, social concepts of right and wrong because these are things that they're being taught early on, right? So the dreams will tend to be, and, and, and fictional characters, Santa Claus and, and the Tooth Fairy and these things, that will be the extent of the types of dreams that they will have. They will not have dreams about things they have not experienced. A person in middle age, again, they've had more experiences their dreams will be more vivid, but again, it will be different from, the, and also the, the level of, of memory. So a person in middle age and a person in a senior age will not have a recollection of their extreme childhood. For example, the first one or two or four years, they will have forgotten most of that. So the dreams will not have much to do with that, even though that's embedded in their subconscious. So it will impact their dreams, but they won't realize that, that their the dreams are motivated by their youth. Um, they'll, they'll recognize a lot of the recent things, especially the last 20 years that have happened to them, um, but not the very former things. And the person in the senior, same thing. They have much, much varied um, proliferation of, of experience. And so the dreams may be richer from that. Wonderful. All right. Um, thank you very much, uh, Sanjay. This was uh, fantastic and great set of questions by everybody. Um, I mean, we managed to get to quite a few questions. Um, not all of them, uh, but in some ways, walking away with questions is far more important than walking away with answers. So I'm glad that so many questions got put on the table.